Hi, my name is John Pellerito. I am the Chief Division of Ultrasound, CT, and MRI at North Shore University Hospital in Manhasset, New York. That's Long Island. And my presentation is entitled Ultrasound Evaluation of the Aorta and Peripheral Arteries. In this presentation, we're going to talk about the sonographic evaluation of the abdominal aorta, talk about the evaluation of aortic endografts, then I'm going to move into the evaluation of the peripheral arteries and talk about pseudoaneurysms and arteriovenous fistulas. In this presentation, we're going to discuss the evaluation of abdominal aortic aneurysm, complications of endograft repair, we're going to review the diagnostic criteria for arterial stenosis and discuss the diagnosis and therapy of pseudoaneurysm and arterial venous fistula. We make the diagnosis of abdominal aortic aneurysm when the aortic diameter is greater than 3 centimeters. When the size of the aneurysm is greater than 6 centimeters, then we become concerned because they have a 50% one-year survival rate with a 43% risk of rupture. In general, we say the aneurysm will increase in size about 0.2 to 0 0.4, 0.4 centimeters per year. Indications for the evaluation of the abdominal aorta include patients with palpable pulsatile abdominal mass, unexplained lower back pain or abdominal pain, and patients with known extremity aneurysmal disease. For our sonographic evaluation, we're going to evaluate the extent of the aneurysm in both longitudinal and transverse planes. We're going to determine the amount of intraluminal thrombus. We're going to assess the residual lumen, look for evidence of periaortic hematoma, and also assess for involvement of the renal and iliac arteries. Usually for this study, we like to have patients perform a 12-hour fast prior to the examination, and this reduces the amount of scatter and attenuation from bowel gas. We don't give any pre-medication normally, and we typically will scan the patient in the supine position. The normal abdominal aorta typically demonstrates smooth margins and tapers distally to the iliac bifurcation. The normal diameter, usually about 2 centimeters or less, and it's important to recognize that the abdominal aorta supplies both low and high resistance arterial beds. Here are two samples taken from the abdominal aorta at the proximal and distal levels. The sample obtained from the proximal abdominal aorta demonstrates its forward flow component in systole and then is continuous forward diastolic flow. And this is related to the fact that the proximal abdominal aorta supplies blood to the liver, spleen, and kidneys which demand continuous forward flow both in systole and diastole. The distal abdominal aorta distributes blood flow to the lower extremities, which typically have high resistance to, to blood flow in the distal vessels. So samples taken from the distal abdominal aorta typically demonstrate high resistance. And the sample here taken just above the iliac bifurcation shows early diastolic reversal consistent with blood flow in the peripheral arteries as we'll discuss in a little bit. The protocol as taken from the ACR practice guideline includes the acquisition of transverse images, typically in the proximal abdominal aorta near the diaphragm. We'll take an image in the mid-abdominal aorta near the origin of the renal arteries and the distal aorta above the iliac bifurcation. We also want to get a transverse view at the iliac bifurcation as well. We will also be obtaining longitudinal images and taking AP measurements of the abdominal aorta. These measurements should be obtained from outer wall to outer wall, perpendicular to the long axis of the abdominal aorta. For focal aneurysms, we typically will measure the maximum AP diameter to determine the size of the aneurysm. And of course, we're going to determine the relationship to the renal arteries. It is also recommended that we obtain a transverse image of the proximal common iliac arteries, longitudinal images with AP measurements of the proximal common iliac arteries right after the bifurcation. And I think it's also valuable to obtain some color and spectral Doppler information as well, depending on the question at hand. We typically will say that the patient 
has an abdominal aortic aneurysm when the size of the abdominal aorta is at least greater than or equal to 3 centimeters. Of course, this relates to the size of the patient. Patients with smaller body habitus may demonstrate a focal aneurysm at less than 3 centimeters, but in general, 3 centimeters is the cutoff that we use. We say the study is negative for aneurysm when no aneurysm or focal dilatation is identified, and the common iliac artery is also normal in caliber. The study is indeterminate when we have limited or non-visualization of the abdominal aorta and common iliac arteries. Here are a couple of transverse images from an abdominal aortic aneurysm. The grayscale image shows just a small amount of thrombus along the periphery of the aneurysm wall. When we turn the color on, we can appreciate that there is a large amount of intraluminal anechoic thrombus and that the residual lumen is smaller than we suspected from the grayscale image. Here are two sagittal images. The grayscale image shows moderate amount of intraluminal thrombus and the residual lumen. Color Doppler is very helpful to demonstrate flow in the residual lumen. It also helps us to direct the pulse sample volume when we obtain velocity samples. You can see here we're taking the maximum AP dim dimension to estimate the size of the aortic aneurysm. Here's an example of an aortic dissection. The grayscale image is helpful, but it allows us to see the luminal flap or intimal flap very nicely. In fact, sometimes it's easier to see that flap with grayscale because color can sometimes overwrite the flap and it may be more difficult to visualize. With color Doppler here, we can see that there's flow in both the true and the false lumen. Screening is an important part of the assessment for abdominal aortic aneurysm. Recommendations for screening include men 65 years or older, women 65 years or older with cardiovascular risk factors. We also consider screening for patients with a family history of aortic and peripheral vascular aneurysmal disease. And screening populations can include a history of smoking, hypertension, and first degree relatives with the disease. Let's move on and talk about the evaluation of patients that have endovascular stent graft repair for abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is a recent alternative to surgical repair of abdominal aortic aneurysms. In these patients, a graft will be placed transluminally through a small incision in the femoral artery, and then the catheter will be placed through the artery and across the abdominal aortic aneurysm, and then the graft can be deployed in position and expanded to exclude the aneurysm cavity. Some stent grafts are totally supported with stent structure, while others are supported only at the attachment sites. If we look here, we can see a couple of examples of stent grafts. The one on the top uh, demonstrates a bifurcated appearance. The one on the bottom has a single body. Many of these grafts can be modular and consist of several components. There are several complications to consider in the follow-up evaluation of endografts. There can be bleeding following the procedure. We look for evidence of endoleak, either at the anastomotic sites or from within the graft itself. There may be evidence of aortic dissection. Other complications can include infection, distal ischemia. There may be migration of the stent graft or fracture or deformation of the graft as well as graft thrombosis. And ultrasound is very helpful in the follow-up of the stent grafts looking for some of these complications. CT is considered the primary modality for the evaluation of endografts, but ultrasound can be very valuable for screening and surveillance of stent grafts. It is somewhat patient-dependent in that very large patients and very gassy patients may not be particularly sonogenic and difficult to evaluate but accuracy has shown to be related to experience, and ultrasound has proven valuable in defining complications of endografts. One of the keys to the follow-up evaluation of patients treated with endografts is to measure the maximal aneurysm sac diameter. After successful endograft repair, the abdominal aorta should be stable in size or actually get a little bit smaller. The aneurysm should not increase in size if it has been excluded successfully by the endograft. 
For this study, we also assess for perigraph leakage or endoleak, and we're also going to assess for flow through the graft and look for evidence of stenosis or occlusion. As part of the scan protocol, we want to identify the intrasac portion of the graft. We want to follow the graft from the proximal extent all the way to the distal attachment site, checking for evidence of leak. We'll examine the suprarenal abdominal aorta above the graft, as well as the distal runoff vessels, that is the distal aorta or iliac arteries. We want to evaluate the full length of the endograft, looking for flow abnormalities, and we can assess those with color Doppler and by taking velocity measurements at multiple locations, making sure that the graft is patent and looking for evidence of stenosis. We can use color Doppler to assess for any evidence of intraluminal defects, look for evidence of extrinsic compression or kinking of the graft, and we can obtain maximal and minimal graft diameters to make sure that there is no significant change in the caliber of the graft. Here's an example of a bifurcated stent graft. The grayscale image shows you that the stent graft is echogenic and we can demonstrate the walls of the graft very nicely. We turn the color on to demonstrate flow within the graft to make sure that the graft is widely patent, no evidence of any stenosis. We also use color to look for evidence of leak. Color is also important to make sure that we don't see any abnormal flow within the excluded aneurysm cavity. Here's a transverse view through the same bifurcated graft. Again, notice on the image that we can see flow nicely through the lumen of both limbs of the graft, and yet there's no evidence of abnormal flow or signal in the excluded cavity. In the sagittal view here on the right hand side, we can place the sample volume in the limb of the graft, demonstrating normal velocity flow and demonstrate normal flow characteristics, assuring us that the graft is patent and there's no evidence of stenosis. During the study, we're going to assess for the presence of flow within the residual aneurysm sac after endovascular graft placement. Again, any abnormal flow outside the graft suggests the presence of an endoleak. We're also going to assess the size of the aneurysm. Any in increase or expansion of the aneurysm suggests the possibility of a leak. And any leak increases the risk of aneurysm rupture. So when we assess for the presence of endoleak, we want to examine the entire abdominal aortic aneurysm sac for any abnormal flow. We want to document any extra graft flow that we see, and we want to identify the source of flow. Many times we want to document that by obtaining velocity waveforms for flow direction as well as peak systolic velocity, particularly in those type 2 leaks where we see them arising from branch vessels such as the inferior mesenteric artery or lumbar arteries. Here are the different types of endoleaks that we can see from the illustration. Type 1 endoleaks occur at either attachment site, which can be the proximal or from the distal end of the graft. Type 2 branch leaks occur from the branch vessels, which can bring retrograde flow back into the excluded aneurysm sac. And we typically will see that from retrograde flow through the inferior mesenteric artery or through one of the lumbar arteries as we previously discussed. Type 3 endoleak is, is typically device related. There's a breakdown or a separation of the graft and we can have flow coming through the separation or fracture of the graft. Type 4 is related to graft porosity where there's leakage throughout the graft. And type 5 occurs when we just cannot define the site of the leakage. Let me show you a couple of examples. These samples were provided to me by George Berdejo at uh, Montefiore Medical Center. And George has a lot of experience with the evaluation of aortic endografts. Here's a nice example of a distal type 1 endoleak, which we can see with CT correlation. On the CT scan on the left, we can see that there's contrast material within the graft, as well as leakage of contrast material 
into the lumen of the aneurysm sac. And this compares very nicely with the color Doppler image, which show that there's active leakage of blood from the distal anastomotic site into the aneurysm sac. Here's an example of a type 2 endoleak. Here the leakage is from the inferior mesenteric artery, which is bl bringing blood flow back into the aneurysm sac via collaterals. And we can see here that blood is filling the sac, and we can identify the graft more posteriorly, and we can see that the graft is patent. Let's move on to a discussion of the ultrasound diagnosis of the peripheral arteries. Now, obviously, a non-invasive diagnosis is a desirable alternative to arteriography. It should not only detect the presence of disease, but be able to distinguish severe from non-surgical lesions, those that require therapy from those that do not. We also want to use this technique to evaluate the results of therapy, such as angioplasty, stents, and bypass grafts. There are two ways we can perform this study. Typically, I like to start out with the indirect tests, ankle brachial index, segmental pressure measurements, pulse volume recordings, because they're useful for screening and can help demonstrate the level of disease. After I perform the indirect tests and they suggest that there's evidence of a lesion, then we can go on and either do uh, ultrasound screening of the entire lower extremity tree from the aorta down to the calf or ankle level, or we could do a more focused approach where we could do a detailed study at the level or segment of interest defined by those indirect tests. For screening the lower extremity with the Doppler ultrasound, again, it can be a very time-consuming, extensive survey from the aorta down to the ankle levels. And of course, here the goal is to map the lower extremity arterial tree. And this can be very difficult and time-consuming, particularly in uh, elderly patients, diabetic patients, where there's multi-segmental arterial occlusive disease. And for most of our patients, this type of screening examination has been supplanted by either magnetic resonance or CT angiography. In our laboratory, we prefer to do a focused duplex and color flow Doppler examination, again, defined by an abnormal segment identified by the indirect tests. This approach, us, this approach allows us to identify the location, length, and degree of stenosis on the color Doppler image. It allows us to perform a direct application of arteriography for angioplasty and or stent placement based on the color Doppler information that we obtain. And we also use these techniques to follow patients with known lesions for progression of disease, and to also evaluate therapy, such as stenting and grafts. The protocol for the lower extremity evaluation Doppler ultrasound, we want to identify the area of interest with grayscale, color, and pulse Doppler examination. Grayscale is used to define the presence or absence of atherosclerotic plaque. We use color Doppler to sweep the area of interest for narrowing and aliasing. And this requires optimization of the color Doppler parameters. This is a very important step because it allows us to sweep the vessel very quickly looking for evidence of flow abnormality. If we tweak the pulse repetition frequency for flow in the normal area, then when we see focal areas of increased va vascularity, it'll show up as a focal area of aliasing. And once we identify these abnormal areas of flow, then we can place the sample volume within this site of flow disturbance to get out pulse Doppler samples. It's important to remember common sites of atherosclerotic disease, typically involving the bifurcation points of the lower extremity arterial tree. And that would include the femoral bifurcation, popliteal trifurcation, and it's also to remember to evaluate the distal superficial femoral artery in the region of the adductor canal which is an important area of disease in diabetic patients. For these studies, we typically use a 5 megahertz linear transducer, which works for most patients just as it does for the venous examination. If we have a very large patient, and then we may switch to the 3 megahertz transducer so that we have adequate depth penetration. In pediatric patients or patients with small body habitus, we can increase the frequency range to have adequate depth penetration. 
Again, we want to optimize both the grayscale and the color Doppler parameters to laminar flow in the vessels of interest. We'll adjust the pulse repetition frequency to detect hemodynamic disturbance and then be able to perform pulse Doppler samplings in the regions of color aliasing. Now, this is probably the most important slide in this presentation of the peripheral arteries because it defines normal flow. Now, of course, it's important to be able to recognize normal if we're going to be looking for evidence of subtle changes of disease in our Doppler samples. The normal peripheral arterial waveform has a triphasic character. We see our initial forward flow component in systole, and this is related to ventricular contraction, which propels the red blood cells down the lower extremity. We typically see early diastolic reversal, and this is related to distal peripheral resistance. And then later on, we're going to see a smaller forward flow component in systole, and we think this is related to elastic recoil of the vessel wall. So initially in systole, the vessel wall is expanded, and then it snaps back into place, further propelling the red blood cells down the lower extremity. It's also important to note that the normal peripheral arterial waveform should have a narrow systolic window, and that's the area under the curve here. And this indicates to us that at the point of the sample volume, all the red blood cells are moving at approximately the same velocity at any given point in time. And of course, we're going to notice the normal velocity range. And here in this sample taken from the deep femoral artery, we see the peak systolic velocity is about 80 centimeters per second. Obviously, it's important to recognize normal peak systolic velocity ranges for the vessels. And you can see here that as with most arteries in the body, the peak systolic velocity ranges from between 40 to 100 centimeters per second. In the femoral arteries, the range is about 80 to 100 centimeters per second, and velocities will decrease. As we proceed down the lower extremity in the popliteal arteries, the velocity is 60 to 80 centimeters per second. And when we get to the tibial arteries, the velocities are in the 40 to 60 centimeter per second range. When we evaluate samples obtained from the lower extremities, there are three things that we're going to evaluate. We're going to look at the waveform shape. Is it triphasic or not? We're going to look at the peak systolic velocity, and we're going to look at the spectral window. These three characteristics are used to classify the degree of disease in our examination. Let's review the categories of disease. We say a mild lesion is 1 to 19 percent diameter reduction, and this occurs when there's mild narrowing of the lumen of the vessel. You can see here on the color Doppler display that we have a laminar looking flow pattern within the lumen. We place the sample volume in the region of narrowing and make sure that we have adequate Doppler samples for re review. In this patient, we can see that the peak systolic velocity is about 140 centimeters per second. So it's up to a 29% increase in the peak systolic velocity compared to the normal proximal segment. And that's how we evaluate peak systolic velocities in the lower extremity arteries. We take a sample from the area of narrowing, the area of focal disease in the vessel, and compare it to the normal proximal segment, typically about two centimeters proximal to the stenosis. A mild lesion has up to a 29 percent increase in the peak systolic velocity compared to the normal segment. We can appreciate in the sample that we maintain a normal triphasic waveform. In patients with a moderate lesion, that is 20 to 49 percent diameter reduction, will have an increase in spectral broadening, that is fill-in of the spectral envelope. We have up to a 99 percent increase in the peak systolic velocity, that is compared to the proximal normal segment. In this example here, in the common femoral artery, we can see that there is narrowing of the lumen. Color Doppler shows us aliasing in the jet at the site of the stenosis, and pulse Doppler sampling in the region of the jet demonstrates a velocity of about 180 centimeters per second, which again is not, going, is not quite double the peak systolic velocity in the normal proximal segment, so we say it's a less than a 50 percent stenosis. Another important thing to remember, 
then when we have a 20 to 49 percent stenosis, we maintain the diastolic reversal in the waveform, as we see here. This changes when we have a significant stenosis. And we say a lesion is flow reducing or significant when it's 50 to 99 percent diameter reduction. At this point of luminal diameter stenosis, we see a change in the flow pattern. We lose our reverse flow component. So we see flow only in one direction through the stenosis. In this example, we have a high-grade lesion in the right external iliac artery. We place the sample volume in the stenosis identified with color Doppler, and we can see we're aliasing at over 300 centimeters per second. Notice that the spectral window or envelope is completely filled in, marked spectral broadening. We have greater than 100% increase in the peak systolic velocity compared to the normal proximal segment. We say the waveform has a monophasic appearance, that is, flow only in one direction. And this occurs because at the site of a flow-reducing lesion, the red blood cells get sucked through the lesion, through the stenosis, because of the pres pressure reduction on the post-stenotic side. And as we continue to drag the sample volume through the stenosis, we'll see that there's a marked change in the waveform character due to post-stenotic turbulence. With an occlusion, we'll see a loss of flow, absence of flow in the occluded segment, as you'd imagine. We'll see flow in the proximal segment, which may have very damped waveform characteristics. And this is related to the chronicity of the lesion. In an acute occlusion, we'll see very high resistance, low velocity waveforms in the proximal segment, and we'll see very low resistance, low velocity waveforms in the reconstituted segment. In patients with well-developed collateral flow, we may maintain a low resistance pattern in the proximal segment above the occlusion. Here's an example of a sample taken from collateral flow in a patient with severe arterial occlusive disease. And I want you to appreciate the low resistance flow pattern that we see in these collateral vessels. And these vessels are supplying ischemic vascular beds. And these ve vessels typically uh, provide blood flow to vasodilated arteries and these vessels have very low resistance to flow. So we see continuous forward diastolic flow. The other thing to notice on the sample is the rounded contour. There's a delayed peak to systole, which we usually describe as a tardis parvus flow pattern. We can see it has a really rounded waveform appearance, sort of a TP or, or mountaintop configuration. When we see these rounded waveforms, we typically think of proximal arterial occlusive disease. I'd just like to show you this paper that was published some years ago from Rankin his group, which illustrates the value of ratios for defining peripheral arterial disease. In this study, they showed that there's marked variability in peak systolic velocity measurement from the lower extremities, and for that reason, peak velocity ratios work better for divine, defining levels of disease. In this study, they also showed that they can determine at least a 50% stenosis when the peak velocity ratio from the stenosis to the normal proximal segment is at least 2.4. They define a level of disease of greater than 80% stenosis when the ratio is greater than 4 to 1. And they classified a 90% stenosis when the ratio is at least 7 to 1 from the stenosis to the normal proximal segment. There are a number of important color flow findings associated with significant peripheral arterial disease. As I mentioned before, we look for an area of focal color change or aliasing at the site of the stenosis. We may see persistence of color with a high-grade lesion. And this is related to a change from a pulsatile flow pattern to a monophasic flow pattern, which I'll show you in a sec. And we can also look for evidence of color brewy artifacts, which are related to perivascular tissue vibration. We also see evidence of a color mosaic pattern due to swirling of blood flow in the post-stenotic segment. Here's an example of normal triphasic flow. In this example here, we could see that there's alternating red and blue, that is forward and reverse flow, in the femoral artery. Again, as we sweep the vessel, we can see there's a normal flow pattern. 
And of course, we can recognize normal phasic flow in the underlying femoral vein. Here's an example of disturbed flow or persistent color in a high-grade lesion in the superficial femoral artery. Notice how the color persists within the lesion, and this serves as a beacon or indicator of significant stenosis on our color Doppler exam. With pulse Doppler, there are several findings we should be looking for to classify peripheral arterial disease. Again, we look for elevated peak systolic velocities within the stenosis. There's loss of diastolic reversal in the waveforms obtained within the stenosis. Many times we see evidence of a brewery on the pulse Doppler sample. And again, as I mentioned earlier, as we drag the sample volume into the post area, we may demonstrate tardis parvus waveforms distal to the high-grade lesion. Here's an example of a significant stenosis in the superficial femoral artery. We place the sample volume within the stenosis, and we see the peak systolic velocity is about 250 centimeters per second. Now, this is a monophasic waveform. That is, blood flow is going in the forward flow direction and systole and diastole. You notice here that we see some information below the baseline here. And in fact, you should appreciate that it actually occurs on both sides of the baseline. It's a diamond-shaped artifact, and this is related to perivascular tissue vibration. In other words, this is a brewery that we see in the tissues identified on the spectral tracing. As we continue to move the sample volume into the post region, we see there's a marked loss in velocity and a breakdown in the waveform shape so that we have a disorganized flow pattern, low velocity, bidirectional, with a rounded configuration. Here again, we're seeing tardis parvus waveforms in the post area, indicating the severity of disease. Here's another example, this one taken from the popliteal artery, a high-grade lesion seen in this location. The peak systolic velocity is about 200 centimeters per second. Again, notice all the characteristics that we look for. High velocity, spectral broadening, continuous forward diastolic flow, loss of diastolic reversal. These are all the key findings that we look for to classify a severe stenosis. And as we continue to move the sample volume into the post area, again, we see a very disorganized flow pattern. We lose velocity. We have bidirectional flow and a rounded waveform, the tardis parvus waveform, again, indicating that this is a post waveform and that there's significant proximal disease. Let's take a look at this example. Here's two waveforms taken from both common femoral arteries. It should be pretty clear to you that the waveform from the right common femoral artery is normal in appearance. It has a triphasic character, peak systolic velocity within the normal range. We identify diastolic reversal. Whereas the waveform taken from the left common femoral artery is low velocity, has continuous forward diastolic flow, and has a rounded configuration, a tardis parvus appearance. So this indicates to us that there should be a proximal lesion. And because we can garner this information from this waveform shape, we will look up proximally into the external iliac artery and identify it. a tight stenosis at the level of the external iliac artery. The color Doppler image demonstrates aliasing at the site of the stenosis. And when we place the sample volume at that level, the peak systolic velocity is over 450 centimeters per second, consistent with a very severe stenosis. Finally, let's just spend a couple of minutes talking about femoral artery injuries. Femoral artery injuries occur about 0.2 to 2% following diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. The incidence of these injuries is increasing due to the use of larger catheters, more complex procedures, and the concomitant use of anticoagulation. Early diagnosis is necessary to avoid potential complications that can occur. And these complications include large femoral hematomas, pseudoaneurysm, arteriovenous fistula, arterial dissection, and arterial occlusion. Let's first discuss pseudoaneurysm. Now, pseudoaneurysms are vascular masses that are separate from the underlying artery and are connected to the artery by a communicating track or neck. These result from a hole in the arterial wall and blood flow escapes through the hole into the surrounding tissues and the blood flow is confined by surrounding soft tissues and hematoma. 
These are usually related to an arterial puncture from a diagnostic or therapeutic procedure, but may also be seen, be seen related to other forms of trauma or infection. The most common predisposing factor to the f formation of pseudoaneurysm is insufficient manual compression, that is less than five minutes of compression following the procedure. We also see pseudoaneurysms occur with other types of procedures, such as simultaneous cannulation of the femoral artery and vein, the use of intraortic balloon pumps, continuous arteriovenous hemofiltration, and after angioplasty with or without stent placement. Here's a clip of a pseudoaneurysm, and on this real-time image you can see that blood flow is escaping from the underlying artery and is swirling in this mass that it connects to the artery by this tract. So we see swirling color flow within the cavity, and if we freeze it here, we'll get that typical yin-yang appearance. We can identify the communicating tract or neck between the artery and the pseudoaneurysm cavity. If we place the sample volume within the neck, we'll see a typical to and fro flow pattern, and we can characterize that flow pattern as we see high velocity jet entering the neck during systole and a reversal of flow back into the artery during diastole due to a change in pressure. And we can characterize that flow pattern very nicely by placing the sample volume within the neck of the pseudoaneurysm. And here we can see blood flow going into the pseudoaneurysm and systole, and then there's reversal of flow back into the artery throughout diastole, to and fro flow. There are a number of different treatments that can be performed for pseudoaneurysm. If the pseudoaneurysm is small, typically less than one centimeter, we can just watch the pseudoaneurysm. We can be conservative and see if it spontaneously thrombosis. When pseudoaneurysms are very large or complex, they may go on to surgical repair. Years ago, we used to perform ultrasound guided compression repairs because it was a non-invasive treatment. But today, we prefer thrombin injection for the repair of those pseudoaneurysms that were amenable to ultrasound guided compression repair. There are also other types of interventional techniques such as balloon occlusion which can be performed on unusual types of pseudoaneurysms such as axillary or brachial pseudoaneurysms. Thrombin repair is a non-operative alternative to compression repair. With these procedures, a needle is placed into the pseudoaneurysm cavity under direct ultrasound guidance. Thrombin is then injected directly into the cavity while we watch with ultrasound. And in most cases, we see immediate thrombosis of the pseudoaneurysm. And this has proven to be a fast and effective treatment. Hold up right there. This technique was originally described by Kang and his group in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. In his initial series, he described thrombin injection in 20 of 21 consecutive pseudoaneurysms. Typically, he would inject 0.5 to 1 milliliter of thrombin into the pseudoaneurysm cavity directly under ultrasound guidance. In 15 of the 20 cases, there was immediate thrombosis of the pseudoaneurysm occurring in less than 20 seconds. Five required a second injection, and in his series, there were no complications or recurrences. Here's an, an example from our series that we published a few years ago. And here we can appreciate, here's the femoral artery. Here's the region of the pseudoaneurysm neck. And then we can see flow in the pseudoaneurysm cavity. This patient was prepared for thrombin repair. Typically, we assess the pseudoaneurysm. We, we get informed consent from the patient. And then we will place the needle into the pseudoaneurysm cavity. Typically, we turn the color Doppler off as we place the needle so that we can appreciate the location of the needle tip. We want to make sure it's in the center of the lumen of the cavity away from the pseudoaneurysm neck. The goal is to just inject the, the pseudoaneurysm with thrombin and avoid injection of the neck or the underlying artery, which can produce distal thrombosis or embolization. Here in real time, we can appreciate the injection, the swirling color. You'll see that there'll be immediate thrombosis of the cavity 
after the injection. Here's another example here. You can see that there's immediate thrombosis. Finally, just let me discuss the diagnosis of arterial venous fistula. Here we see an example of a fistula between the common femoral artery and vein. We place the sample volume at the site of the fistula, and we typically see high velocity, low resistance flow within the fistula. And here's the arteriogram, which shows contrast material within the artery and the early draining vein. One more example of arterial venous fistula. Again, I want you to appreciate that with the sample volume on the arterial side of the fistula, we have high velocity, low resistance flow, a change in the typical high resistance flow pattern because now the blood flow is feeding a low resistance circuit. So we go from a high resistance to a low resistance pattern. And if we move the sample volume into the venous side, at the side of the fistula, we see an arterialized flow pattern in the vein. In conclusion, ultrasound is extremely valuable in the evaluation of the abdominal aorta for both screening and diagnosis of abdominal aortic aneurysm, as well as defining complications of aortic endografts. We use it routinely in the evaluation of peripheral arterial disease to characterize focal lesions, monitor disease progression, and direct the appropriate interventions and assess the response to those therapies. And finally, in the diagnosis and treatment of pseudoaneurysms and arterial venous fistula. Thank you.